Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? It's good. Man, I feel like it's been a very long time since I've been up here. Last time I think was in, in December going through our Christmas theme. So it's been a little bit, but it's good to, good to be up here. It's good to, to be together as church family. You know, one of the things they always tell you about uh, speaking in public is you're never supposed to let people know that you're nervous. But if I'm honest, preaching God's word is nerve-wracking. See, the thing is, I want to I be able to present it um, accurately and remain humble and faithful to whatever it is that he asks. And so in that sense, yes, I am nervous being up here, and that's actually okay. Because I know that our Father in heaven also gives us everything that we need to do what he asks of us. All we have to do is trust him at his word. And that's, that's a beautiful promise, isn't it? <clears throat> anyway, um, how many of you remember when you first came to Christ, have a very vivid memory of when you first came to Christ? There's a few hands going up. Don't be shy, guys. It's okay. <laughs> um, as new, uh, newborn baby Christians, we were on fire, right? Or at least most of us. We were hungry for more of Jesus. Um, I know when I came to know Christ those first six months, it felt like I was untouchable. It felt like I was on cloud nine and nothing could bring me down. I was just floating, moving along in life. Nothing could go wrong. But then with, with time, maybe seeing our friends uh, not respond the way we had hoped that they would, or we're, we're, life just changes and we're, we're faced with some different difficult situations, circumstances change, change we, we begin to lose a little bit of that fire, don't we? It slowly dwindles down. And how often don't we end up losing sight of our Heavenly Father in those instances? We begin, to, we begin to think, oh, I can do this on my own. You know, I believe in Jesus, and, and I'm not stealing, I'm not cussing, and I'm not, I'm not doing what this person's doing. So we kind of just go along, just floating along, without inviting our living hope to join in in our daily walk, right? And as we do that, it continues to get harder and harder to stay faithful to those morals that we think we have, right? I think this, honestly, I think this is something that's really plaguing our churches in North America. We've become complacent. Francis Chan says, if you took the Holy Spirit out of your church, would anyone notice? When I first read that and heard that quote, that really kind of pierced in my heart, like, man, if, if, uh, if we take the Holy Spirit out of what we're doing at church, does anybody even notice? Does anything change? In other words, are we so reliant on our programs that we forget to invite our living hope to be a part of it? So maybe, maybe you're asking, what is this living hope? And honestly, I think, I think in our head, in our mind, we all know that this living hope is Jesus Christ. But do we live as if we believe that? Do we really live in such a way that we believe that that is the truth? So I want to look at this portion of scripture, uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 9. Uh, 3 through 9 is the main passage, but I'm going to look at the verse, first two verses a little bit as well. Peter gives us a very, very clear picture of the living hope and encourages us to keep, uh, to remember our, uh, and remind ourselves of that hope we have in him. So before we get further into the passage, I'm going to read the first two verses and then I'm going to briefly look at the context as to what is Peter writing to, what are the circumstances that, he, that the people are dealing with. In the first two verses it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So obviously, right from the get-go, we see Peter is the author. Peter is the one that's writing this. This is the same Peter that... Um, in the, old, uh, in the Gospels, always sticks his foot in his mouth and speaks before he thinks. He's the, he's the same one that said he would never uh, deny Jesus. And then uh, 
The next morning, he denies that he knows Jesus three times. He's also the first one to acknowledge who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. And then he also, in this passage, points out who he's writing to. Peter is is writing this letter in Rome, um, and he's writing to uh, the exiles. Some translations also say aliens that are scattered. So why, why are they scattered? Well, at the, at the time that this book was written, Rome was under the rule of Nero. Nero, um, Nero was known for his hatred towards Christians. Some believe in, in 64, I think it was, that Rome burned, and there's those that believe that Nero burned it, but then he blamed it on the Christians so that as a culture, as a society, they would, there would, be, they would unite behind their hatred for the Christians. One of the things that Nero was known for doing was, was uh, taking Christians, setting, tying them up, setting them up in his gardens, in the palace, uh, covering them in tar, and then lighting them on fire as lamps for his garden. So for, for these believers, their, their, their faith in Jesus really was a matter of life and death. To put their faith in Christ meant their life was at risk. And so these believers have scattered throughout the region, all these places that are mentioned here. And this is what, is no, what we know today as the country of Turkey. I know, for, I, so, I know for some of you this kind of information, this historical information probably doesn't mean much, but I really think it's very crucial to understanding the message behind what the author is saying because scripture can really only mean what the author intended it to mean originally. And then we can go from there to understand what it means for us. I also quickly want to point out uh, some of these words here, uh, elect and chosen. There's a lot of controversy over words like this, um, this idea that God has specifically chosen us either for heaven or or for hell, and we don't actually have a choice in whether we follow Christ or not. It's kind of predetermined. But there's also that word foreknowledge in here, and I think that's a very important word to, to remember here, to remind ourselves of. Yes, God has chosen us, but it's because of his foreknowledge. He knows us. He knows us better than we can ever even know ourselves. And so, yes, he knows our choice. He knows whether we're going to choose to follow Christ or not, but that in no way takes away from our ability to either accept that gift of salvation or reject that gift of salvation. I mean, Christ gave himself for all. We see that very, very clearly in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the other thing is words like this in this passage that Peter is is writing here also would have very different meaning to the people listening to the message. This is very much an Old Testament language kind of thing. Um, The kind of language used to describe God's people in the Old Testament, this kind of language was used, um, God's chosen people, the Israelites. Um, They were set aside for God's purpose, you know. And so, in in, in that way, this language might seem kind of exclusive to just a few that are chosen, but it's actually expanding the invitation to the Gentiles because Peter is writing to the Gentiles here. So with, with that, I'd just like to challenge us to not get caught up on specific words in, in Scripture. And if we're going to study those words, let's understand the context, let's understand what's being said before we base uh, theology around it. Let's stay focused on the bigger picture of, of the message of God's Word. Anyway, that, that's a little bit of a side note. I just wanted to point that out. The point is that Peter is writing to believers who are dealing with intense, brutal persecution and difficulty. He's encouraging them that they are known by the Father. They are known by him through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. For what? To be obedient to Jesus Christ. And even here we see the, we see the Trinity right here. The Father, God the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, Jesus Christ. We see the Trinity in this this passage. So now that we know the context a little bit more, let's continue on 
with the main passage. Verse 3 through the first part of verse 6, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. So in the, in the first two verses, it's, that's the, the introduction to the book. It's identifying who is the author, who is he writing to, and also reminding the listeners of who they are in Christ. Now here, Peter reminds, us, uh, reminds them of, of who it is that they have put their faith into. Right off the bat, he reminds us that, uh, that God is the Father of Jesus Christ. And it is through the Father's great mercy that we are given a new birth. And this new birth... This new birth is into that living hope which is Christ Jesus. And it is through the resurrection of Jesus. And and just this passage here, we have the full presentation of the gospel message in just a few verses. It's such a beautiful, beautiful, short passage of the gospel. Do we believe that it is a living hope? Do we live in such a way that those around us know that we believe in Jesus? All of us that are involved in the in youth leadership, we, uh, <clears throat> we were in Dallas Monday and Tuesday for a youth pastors conference and listening to these different speakers, uh, being encouraged, being challenged, convicted even. One of, the, one of the speakers asked a question, do those that you are around daily know that you love Jesus? And this qu- question really hit me hard. I mean, I'd already planned on preaching on this message where as, as youth were going through the book of First Peter, a uh, Bible study series, and I, I taught on this first chapter and I felt like I, I just wasn't able to dig into it enough. I covered the whole chapter in one and it just, uh, so I, I'd already decided this is the passage that, that God wants me to preach on and come to terms with that. And then as, I, as, as the, this speaker asked this question, it really hit me. And it, so throughout this week as I've been studying, it's really, really challenged me in my walk with Christ. And when he, when he, wrote the, uh, when he said that, I, I wrote this question down in my notes. Do those on my team know that I love Jesus? Do the other youth leaders know that I love Jesus? Do the people I work with in the office here know that I love Jesus in the way that I live? Do I really believe that we have living hope? Do we as a church believe that? And if we do, do do those around us know it? This passage makes it very clear that it is a living hope. It is alive and active. It's not anything of our own doing. It's by the mercy of our Heavenly Father that opened the door for us to receive Christ, to enter into this living hope. It's through the death and resurrection of Jesus In, in, in verse 4, we see um, <clears throat> that, that this living hope comes with an inheritance as well. This again goes, goes back to that Old Testament language that I mentioned before, and, and that, that, that shows that the Gentiles, that they are now also a part of the family of God. It's no longer exclusive to the Israelites. It, it invites them in. You are also a part of this family. There's an inheritance for you in the coming kingdom. And this, this inheritance is kept for them. It's kept for us in heaven. It's kept for those of us who have put our faith in Christ. And because of our faith, we are also being shielded by the power of God. Again, this points to, it is nothing that we can do on our own power. It is by the power of God, by the power of Jesus Christ, what he has done for us. And then in the first part of verse 6, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice. See, these verses up to this point are a very descriptive explanation of salvation. 
It's the Father's mercy, mercy that gave us new birth, and that birth was into the living hope. We have now gained that hope through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and this leads into an inheritance which is eternity with him in heaven. I mean, what's not to be rejoiced over in this passage, right? So much good news packed into these verses. Then in verse 6, the rest of verse 6 and verse 7, it says, Though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So you hear Peter tells them to rejoice in all those things that are listed before, all the things that God has done in our lives, that God has done for us. Uh, and then he goes, even though you are having to suffer, still rejoice. And like I mentioned before, these believers really understood what suffering was. What they were going through, they really understood what suffering was. Peter knew about suffering. Within the, the context of this passage, I really don't think we can fully grasp what they were going through. I think there's a lot of Christians in other parts of the world, China, North Korea, and the Middle East. They understand what Peter is talking about. They understand the suffering that he's referring to, referring to here. But I don't think, I think we have it too easy here. And we don't fully understand this. I think that's, a, that's also a big part of the reason why across North America, the churches keep declining. It's a sad reality of, of being too comfortable. Now, I know that we all suffer in some way or another. We all go through different things, but suffering for our faith is hard to understand for us because we haven't dealt with it. I mean, who here has been beaten and tortured for their faith? We don't understand that kind of suffering. But I also don't want to take away from, from the, the suffering that we do experience in our lives. It is valid, it is real, the suffering that we go through, the different difficulties that we face in life. Every one of us has likely gone through something challenging in life. And the overarching uh, principle of what Peter is writing here still applies to our suffering, our difficulties as well. So in the middle, in the middle of being persecuted the way they are, Peter tells them that these trials are for the refining or the purifying of your faith. Now, just imagine hearing that. You're running for your life and, and being persecuted for your faith. And now, here's Peter tells you that actually this suffering is for your purification to go deeper in Christ. I, I can imagine in some ways that would feel kind of like a, like a sh shot to the gut, like... What in the world? We're already dealing with all of this and now we're, we're supposed to still rejoice in all of this? I think that'd be a hard pill to swallow. And then he compares it to, to gold being refined or purified. The process of, of, of gold being purified would be they would, they would melt it down to where it got so hot that the impurities would rise to the top then they would skim it off. They would continue, continue this process until it was pure. And the way they would know that it was pure was when they could see the reflection in it, just like a mirror. The trials that we face in our lives can actually do the same thing for us. It's hard to see that when we're in the middle of the trial, but they can do the same thing for us. Like I said, the principle in the passage still applies to us today, even if, even if we don't face the same kind of challenges and suffering that they did then. If we continue leaning into Jesus Christ, holding on to that living hope, again, it's not some dormant hope that's just there. It is alive and active, and it gives us the strength to keep going. We will be purified in the process. It can cause us to go deeper in our journey with Jesus. 
And the more purified we become, the more of Jesus we should be seeing in our own reflection and others should be seeing in us as well. And then in verses 8 to 9, it says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So reading, reading this passage, <clears throat> it seems that it's actually possible to have joy in the midst, in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our suffering. Even though you haven't seen him, and you, you still don't see him yet, you love him and are filled with inexpressible joy. Are we filled with that inexpressible joy? Does it overflow in our lives? But why is it that they're joyful? Why are they supposed to be joyful in this? Why, 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 do we need to, why should we be joyful in our trials? And I think that answer is in verse 9. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, all of this points to an eternal hope. And this is something that I'd never really caught on before as I read through this, but it's an eternal hope. Sorry, I lost my spot here in the notes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an, an, an eternal hope. Verses 3 to 5, Peter, Peter points out salvation, the gospel message, very clear description of the gospel and salvation, what God has done for us. Verses 6 and 7 basically say that this is such a great salvation that we should rejoice even in our suffering. And it is all because we have the future hope of our completed salvation when we spend eternity with Jesus. So I want to ask this question again. Do we know the living, this living hope? Earlier I, I asked the question, if those around us know that we love Jesus. Now I want to, I want to be very careful here, uh, not to make anyone feel discouraged in thinking that we always need to be on this, on this spiritual high, that we bring up Jesus at every single conversation That's, that's not what, what I'm talking about when I talk about do we know um, this living hope. There's this, there's this saying that goes, they're, of so, they're so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. We don't want to become that. We don't want to become so spiritually minded that our mind is just in, in the clouds and we can't have normal conversations with people. That's not where we want to get to. That's not the point. If we do that, we begin to, to lose the, uh, the ability to witness to the lost. We no longer have that connection with them either. But we do have a living hope that should really make a difference in the way that we live our lives. It's in the way that we treat people. Do we treat them fairly? Are we honest? It's in the kind of conversations that we take part in. For example, when, when you're at the workplace, people start making inappropriate jokes. Do we join in and laugh at those jokes? Or do we move along, put an end to the conversation, or go make ourselves busy with something else? Years ago, before I moved to Manitoba, I worked at Howard McCaleb here in Seminole. <clears throat> and I, I would just show up regularly for work. I would work hard. I would just be one of the guys. I would goof off, joke around, have fun with the guys get our job done, but when the conversation would turn to something that I felt uncomfortable with, whether it was dirty jokes or something else, I would just go find something to keep myself busy. I just wouldn't partake in that. I wouldn't cuss when they were cussing. I wouldn't complain about customers or about the jobs we had to do. I would just go on about my day. Just, they would start complaining and just kind of this idea, 
yeah, this kind of sucks, but it's okay. We, we can still get it done. It's not going to take that long. It's only five minutes out of the day or 10 minutes out of the day, you know, kind of, kind of attitude. And I only worked there for about three months. And when I gave my two weeks notice, one of my coworkers came and talked to me a, a, a few times and I'll never forget what he said. One of the conversations he came and said, man, just working with you, seeing how you talk to people makes me want to change how I talk to my family at home. A few days later, he comes and we start talking and he shares and says, man, the world needs more people like you. If the, peop- if the world had more people like you, we'd be way better off. I don't say this to brag. Please do not read it that way. I had no idea that I had make an, made an impact on this guy's life. I felt like I, sh- I should have been more spiritual. I should have brought up spiritual things more frequently in conversations. Taken more opportunities to talk about those things. But just living differently had made an impact. So that's, that's kind of what I'm referring to when I'm talking about when I ask, do those around us know that we love Jesus? Is it evident in our lives? Does it overflow in the way that we interact with people? And this being able to live differently is only made possible by the living hope. When we face difficulties in life, when we feel discouraged, or whether we're on cloud nine and on a spiritual high, Regardless of the circumstances you're in or that I'm in, we need to remember the living hope that we have. This, knowing this living hope doesn't mean that we're always going to be cheerful or happy. We're still going to have our down days. But we have this hope. The living hope gives us strength and we have this hope for eternity. It's an eternal hope. I'll share this quote that I read in a commentary that I think really sums up this portion of scripture. It says, it is not so much that believers are now living full of hope, but that they have a fixed hope, a clear vision of what God will do for them in the future. I'll read that again. It is not so much that believers are now living full of hope, but that they have a fixed hope, a clear vision of what God will do for them in the future. We have a fixed hope for eternity. Knowing that we are saved for eternity should also give us an active hope for the here and now and whatever situation we're in to keep going forward regardless of circumstances, to keep going forward because we have a living hope. Worship team, would you guys come up, please? I'm going to read verse 3 one more time. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do we know this living hope? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to come before you and I just thank you for who you are, Father. I thank you for all that you've done with us, for us, that you're continuing to do and will do. Father, I pray that this living hope would become so active and so evident in our lives as individuals and in our church body here as a whole, Father, that we would really be able to let your light shine through us in everything that we do. Father, go with us, lead us, And regardless of circumstance, that we would keep our eyes fixed on the living hope that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.